If you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and open it up to Luke chapter 1. Um, and as he mentioned to you guys uh, this morning, um, we're beginning a small, like a mini-series here uh, during the Advent. Um, and if you guys haven't heard of that term before, basically it's just uh, the weeks preceding um, Christmas or the arrival of Jesus into the world. Um, as a church, the church as a whole is expect, it uses this time as, as, a, as a time to kind of wait in anticipation of the arrival of Christ and celebrating that what that means to us. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, Christmas is generally a stressful time, right? It's generally a time where you're stressed out about finances, getting the right gift, returning the gift, exchanging. Um, it's, a, it's a time where you're, ex, you're kind of worried about giving so much of your money, your time, your energy. It can be a very burdensome time, right? But what if we were to shift the focus? And that's what we're intending to do with this series is, as a church, shifting our focus from ourselves, our families, and really making it about the arrival, the life, the death of Christ. And, and what, what does that mean for us in terms of how does that shape our perception of Christmas? How does it shape our, how does it change maybe our habits and things that we normally would do? Uh, perhaps instead of making it all about gifts towards us, we may think about maybe changing our habits and making it about serving others as Christ did to us, as he did for us. Um, at the very least, it would totally change our perspective, and, and at the very least, it might even help us maintain our sanity during the Christmas season. But that's what we intend to do at the church here, is over the next several weeks, is looking at what it means for us to celebrate the coming of Christ. Today, we'll look at hope. In the, in the, the following weeks, we'll look at love, how Christ's arrival brings us peace and joy. Uh, so this morning, uh, we're going to look at hope. I want to start off by sharing this with you a short story. In the uh, late 1960s, a young Chinese girl was questioned by the government about the underground church. And she refused to provide any information to them about the church and about its functioning. And ultimately, this young girl was tortured severely day after day after day for her to provide the information that they wanted. But she never gave in. She never revealed information on the church. And sometime later, somebody asked her, how did you manage to withstand that suffering? And this is what she said. It wasn't hard. I was taught by my pastor that the real torture lasts very little. For one minute of torture, there are 10 minutes of glancing at the enraged faces and the implements of pain. I decided to keep my eyes closed the whole time. I did not see the stick before it hit me or afterward. The suffering was much reduced. She went on to say, when the communists became aware of my defense, they stuck my eyelids open with tape, but it was too late. My vision had taken on a new aspect, and I had seen God as so many had seen him before. My vision had taken on a new aspect, and I had seen God as so many had seen him before. The hope of this young girl was planted on the vision that she had of God. And although she had been experiencing physical torment and suffering during the entire time that she was being questioned by the Chinese government, she was able to withstand that torment because she had a vision of God, a vision of him. And that allowed her, empowered her to withstand the torment that she faced. For many of us, for many around the world, it would be easy for us to to give in to the despair, to give in to the pain, and to, to basically just say, I give in. I'll tell you what you want to know. It would be easy to think about ourselves or think about the well-being of our families and to just say, I give up. I'm giving in to this persecution. But for her, her vision was much greater than herself or her family. And I believe that's what allowed her to withstand the persecution she was facing. This morning, we're going to look at a couple who adopted the same kind of vision. I'm going to ha just keep the Bible here. It's a security blanket for me, but I'm going to keep it just right. The Word of God is behind me and before me, so I'll keep it there. Um, we're going to look at a couple uh, who had the same type of vision, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now, it's interesting that this first section of Luke chapter 1 really doesn't have anything directly to do with the birth of Christ, but it has something to do with the birth of another person, John the Baptist. 
And it's interesting to see how this was the way God used, or these people were the way God kind of used to kind of speak his voice to the world through Zechariah and Elizabeth. I just want to give you a couple of facts about Zechariah and Elizabeth as we understood it through the scriptures. There are a couple who are very prominent in their culture. Zechariah was a priest. Elizabeth came from a family or lineage of Aaron, who was the first high priest of Israel. The scripture describes them both as being righteous, blameless, obedient before God. And this means that this, this was a couple that was well respected amongst their community as well as among God. God saw them and understood that this was a blameless and righteous couple. This is especially important when we consider this moment in Israel's history. I don't know if you know this or not, but it has been 400 years since God has spoken to Israel. Zechariah and Elizabeth are living in a time where God has not spoken to, the, to Israel in 400 years. Can you imagine that? 400 years without hearing a word from God. Prior to that, God had spoken to Israel through the prophets. He sent one prophet after another, but each time a prophet would come up, Israel's response was to persecute, to ridicule, to even kill the prophets God was sending. The reason? Israel didn't like the message that the prophets were, were telling them. Although the message was coming from God himself, these prophets were merely just the messengers. As a result of their response, God ultimately silenced himself. He did not talk to them for several hundreds of years. 400 years is a very long time to go without hearing from God. Oftentimes, when my wife is upset with me, I'm glad she just walked out. Oftentimes, my wife is upset with me. She will give me the silent treatment. Now, it's not always the case that she's doing it intentionally, but sometimes she's just doing it because she's just angry with me and can't really muster up a word to talk to me or say anything to me. And so it drives me crazy because and it produces a, lot, a wide range of reactions. One, I could be very angry with her for, because I didn't do anything wrong, and, and I don't understand why she's giving me the silent treatment. And I'm, I'm trying to prove to her that I'm, you, know, you could talk to me. I didn't do anything wrong. Then there are other times when I feel like, yeah, I definitely deserve the silent treatment and much worse for what I did. There are other times where I just want to feel like I'm defensive. You know, there's, a, there's a wide range of responses whenever my wife sentences me to the silence treatment. And it just pr prolongs as the time goes on, just makes it worse and worse. But in a very, very real sense, Israel is probably feeling a wide range of emotions right now as God, through, with God's enduring silence towards them. Some of them are probably angry at God, angry at him for the fact that he has been so silent towards them when they don't feel like they've done anything wrong. It was their ancestors that committed the crimes. Why are they being punished for something that their ancestors did? Or maybe they're feeling a sense of grief because they realize that, yeah, we deserve this. You know, we deserve God to be silent towards us because our ancestors did screw up. And now we don't know if God will ever speak to us again. We don't know if God's silence towards us will be forever. And then there's probably another group of people that would say, look, God and us, we're never going to come to terms. So let me live my life without him. Let me carry on and just do my thing without God. This is what makes Zechariah and Elizabeth's story so powerful and so amazing, is that in this context, they are found to be obedient, blameless, righteous before God. Although God hasn't spoken to their nation in hundreds of years, they still remain faithful. And you know something else that makes their story so much more beautiful? Is that in verse 7, we understand that they are without child. The one thing that they had been wanting for, more so than anything else, was a child. But they never realized that. And in Jewish culture, a child is something that when you receive a child, you know that you're blessed and honored of God. But for them, they never realized that blessing or that honor. And ultimately, I believe, and it, we kind of read it on in, in further on in Luke chapter 1, is that Zechariah and Elizabeth became a, mock, a mockery amongst people. There was a great deal of reproach held against them because of the fact they never were blessed with a child. 
So families and friends were probably mocking them behind their backs or maybe in front of their face saying, you still haven't been blessed with a child. And by now, the scriptures tell us they are very old or they're very advanced in years. So biologically, it's impossible for them to have a child. But yet, in the midst of God not providing them a child, Zechariah and Elizabeth are still serving the Lord. They're still obedient. They're still faithful. This is the things that makes it so interesting to me as far as their devotion to God. And before I get back into the text, I want to just take a break. As we enter into the Christmas season, I believe some of us, or most of us, if not all of us, are probably going through a situation or a struggle that can produce some sort of despair in our lives. Some of us are probably in the midst of final exams. You know, we know that Christmas break is coming up, but right before the Christmas break is a lot of finals, right? We're probably stressing out about how are we going to get through this semester? How are we going to finish up this semester? Because I really need this grade in order to make it, in order to pass the class. And some of us are stressing out about the fact that you got a lot of financial expenses coming up. Christmas means that you probably have to buy gifts to, for people. And so how am I going to make it work when I'm already struggling financially? Then maybe some of you here may have a family or a friend that is going through some sort of medical issue or medical illness. And you're struggling just to focus, uh, focus on your other stuff, because, let alone Christmas, because you're so consumed with the well-being of your loved one. All of us may be going through some sort of despair, something that's troubling us. And this brings up a question I think we all have to answer. How do we respond when we find ourselves in disparaging situations? How do you respond when you find yourself in a disparaging situation. See, in my line of work, I come across people in despair every day. For those of you who don't know, I'm a counselor. I work at the Dallas County Jail, and I work amongst inmates who are housed on suicide watch. So every day, I'm coming across a different person who's on suicide watch. People who I come across are there with a wide range of emotions. Some are angry, some are afraid, some are just flat out uh, defensive. Others are in deep, deep depression. One of the things I've learned about all of their experiences that kind of unite them is the fact that all of these inv individuals are driven by their emotions. All of these people are driven by their emotions, and they're unable or unwilling to think rationally outside of what's going on. They're unable to break away from what they're feeling at the time. And it makes our job really difficult because we cannot break through to them because they have bottled themselves up with this, these emotions, anger, frustration, whatever it might be. And to give you an example, even at this very moment, there is a gentleman in the Dallas County Jail who has been on suicide watch for two months. That's an abnormal, abnormal amount of time. Usually three or four days, it will, usually people are off suicide watch. This person has been on suicide watch now for two months. And even in spite of being on suicide watch, he has, attempt, he has tried to hang himself three different times. Even in our custody, he has tried to hang himself three different times. He doesn't speak to us. When he does, his words are something like, I'm beyond help. There's nothing you can do for me. And the first chance I get, I'm going to kill myself. How do you reach a person like that when all they want to do is try to kill themselves? And I don't know what emotions he's experiencing. I don't know if it's anger, if it's depression, or what it is. I can't even gauge that. I can't gauge it. But all I know is that he is bent on trying to do something to himself because he's, burying, he's basically barricading himself behind some sort of anger or depression. He's not allowing himself to think rationally outside with what's going on in a situation. Isn't it true, though, of all of us, somewhat, at least somewhat, that all of us, given our situation, whatever disparaging situation you're in, is that you and I tend to respond in an emotional manner. We, we tend to, to barricade ourselves behind emotions. You know, we've got anger. We've, we feel frustration. We feel fear. We feel a depression, 
all of these emotions are what's preventing us from developing a perspective, a God-given perspective on our situation. Our melting pot of emotions is what's keeping us from drawing close to the Lord. Ironically, it's in difficult times we need to lean on the Lord the most, but it often becomes a time we find ourselves leaning on him the least. This, this morning, as we enter into the Christmas season, as we enter into celebrating the arrival in the life of Christ, I just want you to be honest with yourselves and ask yourself, what, what is going on inside of me right now? What kind of situation am I faced with? What's challenging me right now? What's, what, what's creating a sense of despair? And, and, and what's consuming my mind? What emotion is consuming my mind? Are you willing to let go of that in order to, to, to kind of maintain a focus on the Lord, maintain a focus on the arrival of Christ? See, my prayer for us is that this season would be a, a season of celebrating the arrival of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, and, and, and allowing us to be aware of the fact that we desperately need him. And we can't do it on our own. We can't rely on our emotions. We can't rely on ourselves. We desperately need him in order for us to figure out how to go through this life. Getting back to the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, it's important to ask ourselves, how did they manage to live a righteous, obedient, and blameless life? Did they finally come to a term and say, look, we understand that we're not going to have kids, so we're okay with that, but we're still going to do what we've been known to do. We're going to still obey God. We're still going to follow God. Or did they come to a place where they realized that God's not going to speak to Israel, but we're going to keep serving him because we know that this is a great way for us to connect with each other. Uh, did they give up on hope? Is that how they managed to be obedient to God? Is that they decided just like, look, it's not going to happen, but we're going to do it anyway. As we read on in this text, and if you look back to Luke chapter 1, is that there's a moment in time where Zechariah has been selected to go into the temple to offer up incense, to burn incense. And there's a multitude of people outside the temple praying. The whole act of burning incense is a symbolic way of offering up prayers to God. And so there is this moment in time where prayers are being offered up from the outside and from the inside of the temple. And an angel, Gabriel, appears before Zechariah. I want you to understand the magnitude of what just happened here. 400 years have passed before God has ever reached out to Israel has reached out to anyone. 400 years have passed. But in this moment, as they were praying, God shows up through the angel. And in just one moment, God not only begins redeeming Israel, but he also begins answering the prayers of Zechariah and Elizabeth in just that moment. Did Zechariah say something else in his prayer that made God come down? Did, did, did people, were, were they exceptionally holy that day so that God could come down and answer their prayer? No. I believe that God had ordained that specific moment, that specific time for him to initiate his process of redeeming Israel and ultimately redeeming the world. Please pay close attention to verse 13. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, the angel says. Your prayer has been heard. I just want you to highlight that or, or, or that, that phrase, your prayer has been heard. Just underline it, whatever you can do, because that gives you evidence to the fact that Zechariah and Elizabeth never stopped praying. They never stopped praying for God to restore Israel, for God to provide them with a child. They never, ever stopped praying. Your prayer has been heard. You know, the, the, the term hope is a very ambiguous term. It's really hard for me to explain to you what it is. We tried explaining it, tried to find it here amongst leadership a few days ago, and everyone said good things, but we never said the, the same thing. But rather than focus on how do you define hope, I think the bigger issue is what, what is your, you know, the, the thing with Zechariah and Elizabeth is this, is that Zechariah and Elizabeth had an idea of the big picture. They knew the vision God had for Israel. And I guess the question is, is what vision do you and I hold on to? What is the big picture of your life? Where, where is all of this is headed? What is your life angling towards? What is 
your vision. See, they never lost sight of their ultimate vision. They never lost sight of their vision for Israel and their vision for their own family. Although God had never uttered a word to Israel in 400 years, Zechariah remembered the promises God had made to his ancestors. He remembered the words that God spoke when he said, Israel will be my people, and I will be their God. He knew without a doubt that no matter what condition Israel found themselves in that very moment, he knew that they still belonged to God. And that his prayers were not in vain. His service to God was not in vain because he had a firm conviction, he had a firm vision that God said it, God will do it. Maybe not in my lifetime, maybe down the road, but I know God will do it. In Zechariah and Elizabeth, the fact that they didn't have a child, they were still advanced in years, they kept praying. Why? Biologically, it was impossible for them to have a child. Why keep praying? Because they knew that behind closed doors, there was one who was seeing their tears. There was one who understood that the pain they were going through, the loneliness that they were feeling, even though family abandoned them, even though friends abandoned them, they knew that their God would never leave them, never forsake them. So their prayers for a child were not in vain. And I'm sure they found encouragement in stories like Abraham and Sarah when they had a child when Sarah was around 90. I mean, they took encouragement in knowing that God provided for them. He's the same God that could provide today. They kept praying because they had a vision of who God was. They had a vision of what God was capable of. And ultimately, that is what they held their hope onto, was the vision that they had of God. Let me say this to you. Our hope is only as strong as the vision we keep. If we have an unshakable vision, then we are sure to have an unshakable hope. On the flip side, if our hope is placed on something, or if our vision is on something shaky and feeble, then our hope in that is going to be very shaky and feeble. For example, the Dallas Cowboys. Every year, September rolls around. Super Bowl, baby. Super Bowl. Although I think that's kind of fizzled out. Now it's more like playoffs, baby, playoffs. I don't know about you, but as long as the man in charge is still the man in charge, my vision for the Cowboys is very feeble and shaky. So therefore, my hope in them is very shaky and feeble as well. Um, That's aside, but that's just an example of what it means to have an unshakable vision versus a weak vision. There's only one thing that we can claim as saying is unshakable. The only unshakable vision we can have over our lives is the fact that God is in control and his promises are always true. That's the only unshakable vision you and I have in this earth is that God is in control and that his promises are always true. All right? I want to share you just a a story, another football story, which is a lot more encouraging. Um, Kurt Warner was never picked by any NFL team when he came out of college. It was around 1993 or so, 1994. But he always had a dream that he wanted to be, to be an NFL quarterback. He w- was called by the Packers to come and try out, but unfortunately they had Brett Favre and some other guys that they, the, the guy never had a shot to even showcase his talent. So ultimately he was cut by the team. So he spent the next several months working as a night stalker at a local supermarket, stocking shelves, In the daytime, he would work out, and he would tell anyone who would listen to him that I'm going to one day be an NFL quarterback. And ultimately, the Arena League called, and they said that they were willing to give him a chance. It's not the NFL, but it's something. So he ended up going into the Arena League. Three years later, he's still in the Arena League. A football NFL team calls him and says, look, we would like to try you out, but we don't want you to play for us right now. We want to send you all the way to Europe and play there for about for as long as we need you to, and maybe we'll consider calling you here to us down the road. It was at that moment that he said that, you know, I was really not sure if I could pursue this any further because we had just gotten married. My wife was pregnant. How am I going to go all the way to another part of the world when we're just about to have our first child? What am I supposed to do? But he and his family just agreed that they were going to go ahead and go. So he went to NFL Europe. He was there for a year. 
gets called back by the St. Louis Rams. He's there for a year. He doesn't get to play. Another year comes by, and the starting quarterback is out for the season. And then in that moment steps in Kurt Warner in 1999. So for about five years, he's without and the dream that he had hasn't ever been realized. But five years later, he st step steps out onto the football field. And I don't know if you guys follow football or know Kurt Warner. That year, he broke several records, and he ultimately ended up leading his team to winning the Super Bowl within his first year in the NFL, first year as a quarterback in the NFL. He credits God for his success. He's a strong Christian. He credits the Lord for allowing him to fulfill the vision that he had in his heart. That was what gave him hope to carry on. Is, is he had this vision. He knew this was where he was called. And although it took him many turns and many roadblocks along the way, he maintained that vision because he had a strong conviction that God was with him, that God was leading him. And the rest is history. This, so let me just, actually, I want to read you a quote that he says. People think, and this is what he said after this first season as a start, starting quarterback, people think this season is the first time I ever touched a football. They don't realize that I've been doing this for years, just not on this level, because I never got the chance. Sure, I had my tough times, but you don't sit there and say, wow, I was stocking groceries five years ago, and look at me now. You don't think about it. And when you do achieve something, you know luck has nothing to do with it. He maintained his faith and hope in God. Ultimately, God provided him the perfect opportunity. This morning, I want to ask you, what are you placing your hope in today? For some of us, our hope is built on a number. It's attaining that perfect GPA. It's attaining that GPA that's going to get me into that professional school I want to get into. For some of us, our hope is built on a certain amount in our bank account. If I can get there, then I have reached my goal. I've, made, I've, I've attained satisfaction. For some of us, our hope is built around our body weight. If I can reach that goal, then I've, I've achieved all I want to do in life. I'm, I'll be happy. That's where I want to be. Some of us, our hope is built on finding that certain someone, getting to that relationship, or, or maybe getting into a place where I have a good career or a good job. I'm not saying those are bad pursuits, but I am saying those are weak pursuits. Those are weak pursuits. As we learned today from Zechariah and Elizabeth and from the other stories we shared, the only unshakable hope that we will ever have in this life is found when we establish a vision for God and understand that he controls our lives and that his words are true over and over and over again. They will never be proven wrong. They will always be true. They may not go according to the timing that you want. Like I said, Israel had gone 400 years before they had heard a voice from God. But he will speak and he will provide. He will answer. As long as he said it, his vision for you will come to pass. He provides us an unshakable vision. As I conclude today's message, I want us to understand the hope of God broke into the world through an unlikely couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth. God spoke hope to the world through them and ended his 400-year silence. Through them, God's plan of redeeming the world began. He once again proved to the world that his words and his presence are trustworthy and unshakable. Sometime later, Jesus comes into the picture. John the Baptist is used by God to prepare the way for Jesus, Jesus Christ. And, and as we know, Jesus comes to the world. He lives a perfect life. And ultimately, he dies the perfect death for you and for me. But the beautiful thing about the story is that God has forever ended his silence towards you, towards me. God, through Christ, has spoken his word over your life, and he has forever ended his silence in your life. As you look upon the cross, there stands before you a loud declaration of his feeling towards you, his feeling towards me. I love you, my child. I love you, my son. I love you, my daughter. And this is how I have proven it to you. Just look to the cross. 
praise God, that Emmanuel means that God is with us. But not only is he with us, God has rescued us. He's saving us. He's loving us. And that's something that you and I can place our hope in. That's the unshakable vision of our life is that we have a Savior who has proven his love towards us by dying our death. That is the unshakable vision that we have for our lives. And that's the vision I pray we would carry you with us as we walk out the doors, as we enter into this season and into the next year and then on, is that we would carry with us that unshakable vision of the love God has for us. Let me pray for us. Dear God, I just thank you and I praise you for allowing us to examine the lives of Zechariah and Elizabeth. I thank you, God, that you allowed them to, to minister to us the, the joy of, of the hope that we have in Christ and, and what it means for us to be able to invest ourselves in something unshakable, which is you. This morning, I pray that in the hustle and the noise of what Christmas can be for us, that we would silence all of that and plant ourselves in the firm understanding that we are loved by you. And the cross and the life, the, the death and resurrection of Christ shows us how deeply we're loved. Emmanuel. God with us. Praise you for that truth that we have. Be with us for the rest of this week and as we enter into the further on into the, the study of the Advent series. Give us the grace to be prepared for what you have in store for us. Change us, Lord. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.